So once we've got our flow depths, we can go ahead and we can figure out things like paleoslopes. And to do this, we then need grain size of the bed material. So here's just an example of how we might measure grain size in the field. So this is myself and my field assistant doing a lawn point count of alluvial fan deposits in Utah. Um, now, once we've done that, we can then kind of put our estimates of paleoslope into kind of regional context. So we, I was following these systems upstream to downstream. Um, so I was measuring flow depths and grain sizes in the alluvial fan deposits upstream, and I was tracing it downstream um, to kind of where it was more meandery, that, those kinds of rivers. Um, so if I just add some lines, so effectively what I did was I started to get these kind of upstream to downstream slope transects. And once you've done that, you can, with knowledge of the distance between each of the sites, you can invert this for paleo relief. Now, because I know what the change in slope was between each site and I have the downstream distance, I converted that into the relief. So remember, we're only considering the depositional realm. So I'm looking specifically at the relief in that depositional region. So I started to get estimates of order kind of, I mean, the differences between these lines reflect the different differences between the methods I use. But in general, um, I was estimating around 100 meters of relief across the depositional realm. And if I just pull up, for example, the long profile of the Amazon River, so here's the Amazon River and zero is where the shoreline of the Amazon River is. And here is the kind of source in the Andes. So if we just consider the depositional region of the Amazon River and we look at how much relief there is over the entire section of it, it's again kind of, it gets to a maximum of about 250 meters. So actually these systems are somewhat comparable, but the thing that's really interesting to me is that the Amazon has about 250 meters of relief over 5,000 kilometers, whereas these systems that I'm looking at in the Lake Cretaceous Western Interior, they have about 100 meters of relief, but they have it over only about 160 kilometers. Um, so that's paleoslopes. Um, so that was exciting. And then the next thing that I was also really interested in reconstructing were plan for morphologies. So typically when we've thought about river plan form in the past, we've wanted to call everything even meandering or braided. But the reality is, is that there are so much more varieties of river plan forms um, and that we're kind of limiting ourselves if we just kind of categorize rivers as a meandering end member or a braided end member. So I looked at kind of, so I had some kind of issues with the Fasci's model. So I started looking at quantitative ways to estimate plan form. And I came across these plan form stability fields. So the idea that um, it's basically a phase diagram. So on the X axis, we would have the kind of aspect ratio of a river. So the depth to width ratio. And then on the Y axis, oh, on the Y axis, we would have the ratio of the slope to fruit number. Um, and then, so this is a plan form stability field that's from Gary Parker in 1976. It basically has this dashed line. And if your data sit on this side, you're a meandering river. And if your data sit on this side, you're a braided river. So I basically took a couple of the formations that I was looking at in Utah. I calculated uh, the channel geometries, the paleoslopes, et cetera. And I wanted to see where they sat on a plan form stability diagram. And so, each of these symbols represents each of these formations and they all sit in the meandering realm. So for one of those formations, the Ferran Sandstone, I thought, okay, that's fine because I've been in the field, I've seen the Ferran Sandstone, it's definitely meandering, that's fine. This square represents the Black Hawk Formation. And that was kind of a little bit strange because the Black Hawk Formation has both single thread channels and multi-thread channels. So that was a bit alarming that it sat there. And then finally, the Castlegate Sandstone. I have never seen a more braided system in my life. The Castlegate Sandstone has to be braided. So that, again, was also alarming that it sat on this side of the stability field. So I went back to the, I started looking into these plan form stability fields, and I started looking at the data that they were based on. And I realized that a lot of plan form stability fields are based on very small data sets. And those data, so those data sets tend to have biases. 
So not to pick at Gary Parker, um, but Gary Parker's data set in particular um, was based on a lot of laboratory and flume experimental data. It was based on a lot of data from man-made rivers, so from canals. And when I looked at the natural river data, there were only 53 data points, I think, that came from natural rivers. And all of those data points came from about 12 different rivers globally. Um, most of those were North American rivers. Most of them were gravel bed rivers. So I thought, okay, no, we're gonna, let's reevaluate this. So I went and I built my own data set. Um, so I started going through literature, um, pulling out the hydraulic geometries of as many rivers as I could find. You know, I, my goal was to just get more than 52 data points. Um, and I ended up with about 1,700. And I plotted them all. And I basically, to begin with, I just split them into single thread rivers and multi-thread rivers. And hopefully you can all see that there are a lot of multi-thread rivers that sit below Gary Parker's line. So you thought, okay, plan form stability field doesn't quite work. We might need to move this line. We might need to readjust this. Um, so that's what I did. Um, and I, oh, I don't know if my lines, oh yeah. Okay. Um, so basically I thought, I kind of played about with moving this line. I thought, okay, maybe I just need to like lower it it down a bit but then what we kind of realized is that all we needed to do was put a straight line through here you can see the distribution of the data if you just put a line through there just the aspect ratio alone is probably the best discriminator of what the river platform is um but then going oh the size is the way around um but then going back to kind of the comment that i was making about how we tend to separate everything into braided or meandering and how we're missing out on like a whole other range of plan forms, I decided to break this down further. So instead of just kind of splitting everything into single thread rivers or multi-thread rivers, I decided I was going to split up my multi-thread river data into kind of two end members of multi-thread rivers. And so these were basically braided and elastomosing rivers. So if you kind of go back to this diagram here, if we look at the kind of multi-thread rivers, these are the braided ones. And so by braided multi-thread rivers, these tend to be kind of gravel beds. You know, we have a lot of these bars that might get inundated um, during floods. They tend to be very unstable. They tend to generate new threads by channel bifurcation, so flow splitting. Whereas at the other end member, we have kind of anabranching or anastomosing channels. And these are also multi-thread rivers, but instead these bars tend to be, these are a lot more stable rivers. The bars tend to be more like islands. They tend to be permanent. They might be vegetated. They tend not to move. They're quite stable in time. And they might not get flooded at high flows. Um, they also tend to generate new threads, new channels by avulsion as opposed to bifurcation. So I thought, okay, if I just take my multi-thread rivers and I instead split them up into a kind of the braided multi-thread rivers and then the anastomosing multi-thread rivers, what does that look like? And doing that, I realized that actually slope is a very good discriminator of the multi-thread platform type. Um, yeah, so, and this is super useful in the rock record because now I basically took my new stability fields. So here, my vertical line here was me splitting up single thread and multi-thread rivers. Um, if we just go back to that one. And then when you look at those multi-thread rivers, you can use slope and an estimate of the fruit number, which is quite easy to calculate to get out whether your multi-thread river is a braided river or an asmosing river. And once you've got that kind of estimate, you can kind of get a lot of insights into the kind of processes that are going on in these systems. Having got some kind of insights into catchment geometries, having got, gained insights into channel geometries and plan forms, I then wanted to establish water discharges and sediment fluxes. And I kind of briefly mentioned this. So we have a lot of uh, we have good understanding of flow and sediment transport in modern rivers. Um, so there's a lot of very well-established equations. These are just a couple of examples of them. There are a million different equations that you could use. But long story short is that for our ancient systems, once we've pulled out things like flow depth using bar heights or perhaps using estimates of cross-set thicknesses, which we've scaled up to flow depths, once we've also established the grain sizes of our riverbed, we can go on to estimate the slopes. And once we've done that, 
we can then estimate the flow velocity. So this is just one example of an equation. This is the Mayer Peter Muller bed load sediment transport equation. But again, there are so many more out there. So I've just kind of given you a brief overview of how we might go about estimating catchment geometries and like kind of catchment climate variables. Um, channel geometries such as depths, you can ask me about widths if you want, that's a very tricky one. Um, how we might reconstruct slopes and so on and so on to estimate flow conditions. How we might reconstruct things such as the planform morphology. So now that we can kind of begin to back out these things, what we want to do now is I mentioned before that one of the benefits of gaining quantitative insights into ancient systems is it makes it easier to compare different systems. So I just showed, I, at the start, I showed you this, which is the PETM succession in Spain. So this is the succession in Spain that records the Paleocene Eocene thermal maximum. And the Paleocene Eocene thermal maximum happens here. So that's one place where the PETM is recorded in fluvial strata, but there are other places as well. So here, you might remember this from an earlier slide. This is the Willwood Formation, which is in the Bighorn Basin in the US. This also records the PETM. So, and the PETM occurs at the same time as this very coarse ledge at the top. Here is another place that we records the PETM. Um, this is in the Pionce Creek Basin, which is in Colorado. Um, so I, did I mention, so the Bighorn Basin is in Wyoming in the USA, and this is the Pionce Basin, which is in Colorado in the USA. And here, basically, this is all pre-PETM as you pass subsection, and then this sandy stuff at the top, that's the PETM. So we have three very different catchments. So what we really want to do is, this is what I'm working on now, is trying to reconstruct the catchment geometries, the channel geometries, the channel plan forms, the flow conditions, and to try and piece together how each system responded to the PETM to then compare the system response. And this is really interesting because each of these catchments is very different. So this system in Spain, this is a very short, steep catchment. Here, we are about 10 kilometers from the source region. Um, so a lot of these, this is very coarse material, like we've got boulder grade deposits. Here, this system is kind of an intermediate size system. So the drainage length is probably about 60 or 75 kilometers. So we're further from the source region. Here, this is the biggest catchment. So here we're probably like 150 kilometers away from the source region. So these catchments have very different sizes. So between them, we expect the response to be different. They also have very different climatic responses. So here, everything got warmer and wetter during the PETM, whereas at these two places, everything got warmer, but it got drier. So that's where we really want to take this work next, because it's all good. Like one of the goals of fluvial landscape reconstruction is to try and figure out how ancient systems responded to climate change. But if we're thinking about how modern systems might respond to climate change, we need to have that understanding that globally rivers aren't going to respond the same way to change. So I can't take my insights from the PETM here in Spain and apply this globally because every catchment's different, the tectonic setting's different, the climatic setting's different, and the way that the system changes is also different. But yeah, so that's my final side. That was a lot. But um, as I said, we do have a six-part webinar, which... Basically imagine this, but spread over six webinars with a lot more detail <laughs> and a lot less rushed. So if you are interested in anything in particular, there's probably a webinar for you. Um, but yeah, that's it from me. Okay, thank you, Sinead. Let me just give everyone a moment to unmute themselves so that we can give you a, a round of applause. Thank you very much. I think that gave that gave us a very clear idea of what your PhD was like and also your enthusiasm for what you did and what you achieved. And I'm quite interested to ask you a little bit more about that.